Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Doris Polo in Quito and this is From the South. A possible triumph for the rebellion in Chile as President Sebastian Piñera has suspended the metro fare increase following days of protest. First, we're going to suspend the increase of the metro fare. It will require the approval of a law, which must be very urgent, until we reach an agreement which will allow us to better protect our compatriots. Now, the militarization of Santiago continues after President Sebastián Piñera announced a state of emergency for the provinces of Santiago and Chacabuco on Friday night. Plaza Italia is in the center of the demonstrations and armored vehicles filled with law enforcement and national police have a heavy presence in several key areas. Helicopters were seen flying ahead and residents have expressed concern over the suspension of rights, including the right to protest against costs which have been passed on to working class people. And with the metro now closed for the weekend, demonstrations have materialized above ground. These are the latest images from our correspondents as citizens are out on the streets. They are calling for the resignation of Chilean Security Minister Andres Chadwick, who the fault, or they fault rather, for the repression which took place over the last several days. The president declared a state of emergency will remain in place for the next 15 days with a possible extension. This means the executive can militarize designated areas and limit the public's right to assemble. The measure was taken following demonstrations which escalated in the capital on Friday against a metro fare increase. Police also heightened their repression against the mainly student protesters. The electricity distribution company Enel was set on fire in the melee. Meanwhile, the Plaza Italia, a popular protest center, was closed to traffic with barricades put in place. I have assumed command and control of the military forces and the forces of order and security. And together with civil authorities and the mayor of Santiago, we are mandated to prevent the excesses and damage from continuing to happen in the city and, most importantly, recover as soon as possible people's rights and freedom. The majority of the mobilizations in rejection to the rise of the tickets have consisted of massive evasions. Protests over the price increase of the Santiago Metro spread throughout the city throughout Friday and spilled out onto the streets where police repression was captured in many videos circulating on social media. High school and university students have been the main protest protagonists, although other citizens have joined the call to evade the payment of transport fees. When the students come in all at once, they are protesting in a way that many of us who work can't. So in some ways, it becomes representative. Well, it's good that the young people are coming out to protest because they raise the fares. Because rather than raising salaries, they are raising fares. On Friday, Hondurans protested in streets around the country, demanding the resignation of President Juan Orlando Hernandez following the guilty verdict against his brother Tony Hernandez on charges of drug trafficking and use of weapons. Road barricades were erected in major streets in South, Central and Northern Honduras. The president began his latest term in January of 2018 under accusations of electoral fraud. The former president of Honduras, Manuel Zelaya, called on the military of the Libre Party to organize permanent and nationwide mobilization. The condemnation against Juan on Antonio Hernandez is a condemnation against the president, Juan Orlando Hernandez. At this moment, the Honduran people cannot allow another minute to be governed by crime, by drug trafficking, by dictatorship, by a tyranny, and denies the rights to the people. There will be no peace in Honduras unless there is a government different from the current government. The state of Honduras will have become a sanctuary for drug traffickers. After learning that various witness statements in the case against Antonio Hernandez pointed to some government officials, Honduras started taking to the street to demand an investigation into and punishment of the leaders involved. They have embarrassed the country and have reduced Honduras to their own backyard. They want to continue looting and committing crimes shielded by amendments to the criminal code. 
This comment comes as the National Anti-Corruption Council warns that members of the Hernandez government are preparing a law which will consider offering impunity to persons who participate in organized crime. The proposed criminal code will grant impunity to those identified, as well as to people who've already been sentenced on corruption charges, meaning they can appeal. If this criminal code goes into effect, they can hide behind it, and that would be terrible. Civil society organizations who have taken to the streets are calling for the government to step down as it has been an accomplice to organized crime. The problem that we have is that there are no state powers. We have a judicial system that is unable to execute justice under the existing legislation. Economists have said that if there is no change to the government structure, the country's financial crisis will worsen. There is a real impact to this country's global image. Investors won't want to put their capital in a country governed by drug dealers and criminals because ultimately they want legal security. Opposition sectors have said that protests will increase once the judgment is handed to President Juan Orlando Hernandez's brother. Antonio Hernandez is accused of drug trafficking on a large scale, arms trafficking and giving false testimony. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in a minute. Welcome back. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro has hailed in the country's election to the United Nations Human Rights Council as a triumph over pressure and conspiracies from the United States. Today, we had a great victory at the United Nations in New York. Venezuela has been elected by the world to a permanent seat on the United Nations Human Rights Council, a victory for peace diplomacy. Confronting the plot, the conspiracy, the brutal campaign of the U.S. government, of Donald Trump, a campaign of pressure, persecution against the countries of the world, the governments, to which the International Monetary Fund joined. Bolivians are set for elections scheduled for this Sunday. Opinion polls suggest that the con current country's president, Evo Morales, will see yet another victory. The indigenous leader seeks for a fourth term in office in an election where the winner will have to secure a 40% minimum margin to win in the first round. A first round win requires that candidates receive a 10% lead over their second place rival. You can feel I trust because many international observers and organizations will be present on Sunday. Also, to reiterate, there have been over the past several years different mechanisms to improve the electoral process, which suggests that we have a reliable electoral process. Staying in Bolivia, the country's popular organizations are highlighting a series of achievements and social measures which benefit large sectors of the population. We take a look in this report. One of the first social measures taken following the nationalization of hydrocarbons back in 2006 was the creation of the Juancito Pinto bonus, a measure to reduce Bolivia's school dropout rate. In 2005, when our president assumed office, we found ourselves with a 5.5% rate of school absence at the primary level. Come 2018, we now have a 1.5% reduction. In the secondary level, 8.14% to 3.72%. The bonus consists of 30 annual dollars, a fair amount in Bolivia, paid to each student at the culmination of the school year. In addition, the contracting of teachers was to we don't forget that under previous laws, only the primary education was obligatory. Bolivian men and women are obligated and must attend school until the fifth grade of primary school. But with law 070, all Bolivians are obligated to complete secondary school. 
Another social program resolved the housing problem of almost 200,000 families. That figure is down 20 percent with the emphasis on rural areas. There has been an execution of more than 60 percent in the rural area. The Wana Azurdu bonus benefits pregnant mothers and their children until the child reaches two years old, a change which is subject to medical control, which has reduced child and maternal mortality rates. It's muy bueno. It's good because it's something that serves all mothers. It's good for us women and it helps us a lot. In rural areas, these and other measures are being highlighted. We now live a better life than before. There has been assistance to the Compesino sector. More than 100 years of governance has not seen advances like this in Bolivia. But in these 13 years, there have been advances. These types of programs are carried out in consultation with social organizations, which has consolidated a co-governing understanding between the Labor Union Federation and other popular sectors with the government. From strategic alliance to the coming together of workers and the coming together of workers again, it now deepens our situation of political agreement and co-governance, a natural alliance of workers and government. It's estimated that bonuses, including income supplement for people over 60 years old, benefit half of the population. For active workers, the minimum wage grew from 66 to $301 in a decade. According to experts, these measures redistribute the income of the state and explain the reduction of poverty from 38% to 15%. Now let's take a look at how Bolivian women have won recognition of their rights in the last decade. The new constitution of 2009, a product of a constituent assembly, opened the doors to state recognition of women's rights and demands. The state's political constitution created an opportunity to advance within the legal framework. A specific laws on women's rights such as the integral law to ensure women's life freedom from violence. The law against human trafficking and smuggling. Law 243 against political harassment and violence are an example of that. Up until a decade ago, in this country, women were restricted from owning land in rural areas. When President Evo Morales came to power, only 15 percent of the land titles were in the name of women. Today, 46 percent of agrarian titles are held by women. All of these changes have been experienced and felt by campesino women themselves. This never happened with previous governments. For example, that an indigenous woman, for example, I am Quechua, could be seen in parliament or similar positions. We are empowering women, now it's 50-50. We now have women and assembly members as councillors, as deputies. It really is a process of change. That is why we say now that we have the same rights as men. With this process, Bolivia has been recognized throughout the world and by international organizations. Bolivia is the third country in the world with the greatest political participation of women after Rwanda and Cuba. But not only because they are women, but because they have a lot of voice with a lot of decision-making power both in the lower house and in the upper house. The recognition and exercise of women's rights in society is affirmed and has been an important investment for the short term. Beyond the fact that political participation is a right, the fact that there are women visible but also with strong voices make girls dream that they too can go far and that they too can reach that in the future. The new and advanced legislation, according to experts and women's rights activists, is not enough but it is a step towards demanding the full implementation and exercise of these rights and reducing gender-based violence. 
And in more Bolivian news, the country's Minister of Health has confirmed that the Andean country's unified health system will be extended to Bolivian citizens living abroad. The only requirement will be that they enroll in the embassies and consulates where they live. Bolivians abroad will be able to access free health care using the same system which came into effect on March 1st of this year, providing more than 7.5 million people with medical care over the last seven months. Shifting gears now, this Sunday marks 36 years since the assassination of Grenada's Prime Minister, Maurice Bishop. The revolutionary leader was gunned down during a coup in the Caribbean island. This followed a violent split within the ruling party, which had resulted in Bishop's house arrest. Six days after Bishop's assassination, over 2,000 U.S. armed forces invaded the small Caribbean island in a bid to consolidate a pro-U.S. regime. Bishop was a firm internationalist and Grenada was, a, was perceived as a threat because then U.S. President Ronald Reagan feared other Caribbean countries would follow the country's example. Much like the modern-day revolutionary processes in Latin America and the Caribbean, Grenada's revolutionary government sought to build a society that favored the great majority of people. Bishop made this clear in his powerful speeches. Let's listen as we take a look back. Revolutionary armed forces were forced to storm the fort, and in the process, the following forces were killed. Maurice Bishop, United White Man, Malnutrition, disease, illiteracy. These are the crimes and the sins that have visited upon the poor developing countries of the third world, while the industrialized countries continue to exploit our resources and to keep the profits. But yet, sisters and brothers, in the face of all of that, the Grenada Revolution has nonetheless continued to go forward and to make progress. Thousands of Cubans gathered at Havana's Great Theater to bid their final farewell to the legendary, beloved ballet star Alicia Alonso. People from all walks of life attended the funeral. Alonzo's silver casket was decked in a white veil with white roses. It was placed in front of the theater's grand staircase. The auditorium, which currently bears her name, was the venue where she first performed 69 years ago with her first dance company. Multiple wreaths and flowers also littered the path to her casket, while the Cuban flag was displayed on a wall at the top of a stairway. Many were brought to tears on seeing her body. Alonzo passed away on Thursday at age 98. She achieved global acclaim in the 1940s and went on to run the internationally renowned National Ballet of Cuba for decades. Welcome back. Almost 200 people have been injured in a police crackdown on protesters in Catalonia. The demonstrators had gathered in Barcelona for the sixth day of protests against Spain's Supreme Court sentence over nine separatist leaders who staged a banned referendum on independence in 2017. Riot police used button sticks to disperse the protesters. Meanwhile, Catalonia's president, Kim Tora, has called for talks with the Spanish government to find a democratic solution to the political crisis over Catalonia's quest for regional independence. The defense of rights and freedoms must always be expressed peacefully. We ask of everyone. Violence has never been and never will be our flag in Barcelona, Tarragona, Girona or Leida. Thousands of people took to the streets in Lebanon for the third day of protests against tax increases and corruption. Despite several arrests of protesters by the Lebanese police, demonstrators marched in most parts of the country demanding an overhaul of Lebanon's political system. The protests have been triggered by austerity measures imposed by the Lebanese government as well as poor infrastructure which the demonstrators say need to be revamped. We are trying to show who we are, that we think peacefully and artistically, and what is good is that for the first time everyone is united. But the most important thing is not to stop come Monday. If on Monday they stop, then all that was gained in the last three days is lost. 
Protests continue in Haiti as people gathered outside the U.S. Embassy to protest against the country's support for the Jovenel Moise administration. The protesters, including leaders of various opposition parties, accused the U.S. government of interfering in Haiti's internal affairs. They have since demanded that the White House respect Haiti's right to self-determination and allow its citizens to decide their own destiny. <laughs> It's the Americans who are keeping President Jovenel Moise in power. I cannot take the long road to denounce this, but instead I came here directly so the world can see us and we can bring the news to tell them that it's the U.S. Embassy that is keeping President Jovenel Moise in power. Residents are bracing for a possible eruption of the Piparo mud volcano in Trinidad and Tobago after heightened seismic activity was recently detected at the site. The country's main disaster agency reportedly met with persons who live near the volcano to discuss possible relocation. Geoscientists say recent seismic tests showed significant changes and heightened activity at the central vent over the past week. Last month, residents heard rumblings and explosions at night, then awoke to see fissures and cracks around the area. Several homes suffered extensive damage. The mud volcano last erupted in 1997, displacing dozens of families and killing livestock and birds. Resident Melissa Matura is on the ground in her hometown of Piparo and provides this update. And we're here in Piparo where residents living near the Piparo mud volcano in South Trinidad have been informed that there is heightened activity at the site. The relevant agencies have met with people in the area and alerted them. There is an evacuation plan in place but so far communities near the site have not been given any instruction to leave their homes, at least not yet. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Doris Polo. 